Hi, I'm Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint, and today we're here in Walnut Creek, California. It's considered one of the Bay Area um, cities, and I planted here about 10 years ago close to 50 fruit trees, and I'm going to give you a tour of um, this garden over here where we planted a variety of um, fruits that actually do very well in this USDA planting zone 9B, meaning the nighttime low temperatures between um, December through March are between 25 and 30 degrees. Whereas in Los Angeles, where I'm from, we're in growing zone 10B, where the nighttime low temperatures between the last week of December and the first week of January is between 35 and 40 degrees. So much warmer, much more diversity of plants you can grow. But I want to show you what we can grow up here in Northern California. The first thing I have here behind me is a fig tree. There's actually three varieties of figs that we planted, and I'll give you um, a tour of all of those. But there's three figs, and the reason for planting a diversity within the same species of plants is to help them cross-pollinate for maximum yield of fruit, maximum quality of fruit, and, and for better sized fruit, um, depending on the research that you do. So these, even though one fig tree is self-fertile, by having more figs, you'll actually increase fruit production quality and yield. Um, come and follow me and I'll give you the tour of the rest of the garden. Here is an almond tree. Come and follow me. Um, as you come by, zoom in and take a look at all the fruit. We're actually now in um, the beginning part of June. You can see all the almonds that are actually ripening. Hundreds of almonds on this tree. And here's a second variety of almonds, as you can see you know, indicated by different coloring, different size. So here's the second almond variety. It's always great to have your trees cross-pollinating each other. There's two almonds. The next fruit tree that we have down below is an apple tree. And if you can zoom in closely over here, you can actually um, spot the apples that are actually maturing on the tree. Another fruit tree we've got growing is our um, plum tree. And I think the fruit off of this already came off. But again, here we are in June. This already um, bore its fruit for the year. Here's another, another plum tree. And if we actually go down below, here's a third plum. And yeah, here's, here's actually some plums. I'll actually pick this for, for the picture. So you can actually see, I'm gonna wipe this down. You can see how beautiful these plums are. And you can see all the plums that are actually down here on the ground. So I'll be picking up all the ones that are not damaged by birds later on. And this here is a peach. So we've got some peaches back here as well. And if you come on over, I'm going to need you to walk down below over here. If you can come and follow. And then we've got a nectarine. The nectarines and the peaches also help cross-pollinate each other. They're related enough that they can, that they can help actually one another. So here we are now um, next to a nectarine tree and I want you to zoom in and see the damage that's actually happening on this tree and how our product Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint can actually help this plant. So if you take a look now a little closer into the tree, you'll actually see all of the damage that's actually happening on this bar. This is um, most likely caused by sunburn. As the sun actually works its way up higher in the sky, it'll actually um, be exposed right here um, to this side of the tree. Um, for the rest of the, the remainder of the day. It's, it's been morning for now a couple of hours here, um, but this here will actually be in the sun the rest of the day. If you actually take a look now even more carefully into the bark, you'll actually see the holes, which are caused by both termites and beetles that are actually working their way into the tree. I'm hoping you can actually spot these holes that are going into it. So these um, wood destroying organisms are now um, hollowing out the center of the tree. And if you come a little bit closer, hopefully you can actually see this trail of ants that are actually going up and down the tree. And termites and ants actually have a symbiotic relationship between the two, where the ants will actually harvest the termites, the termites will actually get um, the saps and the, and, the, and the sugars out of the tree and, and, feed the plant, and feed the ants. And that's the relationship between the ants and the termites. But what we're gonna do today is actually coat this with Ivory Organics to help protect, you know, create a seal. Ivory Organics is an organic paint with oils um, that actually repel insects and rodents and um, and it's a special formulation to actually help preserve and protect the tree and give it the maximum life and the maximum health that we can give it. Um, as you can see this tree is severely compromised. This should have been done years ago 
but we're gonna do our best to take care of it today so it hopefully has a longer life and continue producing uh, many more years of fruit. So let's take a look here what I've got. So I've got here a can of the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint. As you can read, it's a natural tree trunk and branch barrier, protection against damaging, sunburn, and insects and rodents. And when you open this can here, it comes with a bag of organic paint powder, and it comes with the oils that actually help repel the insects and the rodents. And we're actually using color brown today so we can actually see the difference. Most of the videos we've done are usually using the white, which offer the most um, sun block protection. But the brown, we're actually using it for creating a natural, um, a natural look when we're done, which I want to show here. So our first step here is we're going to add the organic brown paint powder to the can. We're going to dump its entire contents in there. We're then going to fill up half the can with some pure water. That just goes up halfway. And we'll just stir that up. And after you've added the water, you're then going to want to add the oil. So we'll open up that oil vial, add its entire contents and then fill the remainder up with water. And you can just fill up that can. If you only fill it up halfway with water, it'll be a lot more concentrated, more like a regular paint. But the purpose of this paint is actually to be applied um, very dilute and it's a watery paint um, mixture when you actually apply it. It usually takes a couple of minutes of stirring to get all of the powder into the water. It's actually now going down. Here we go. And you're going to want to stir it every three to five, actually every five to ten minutes to make sure that those oils are actually um, mixed with the rest of the contents. And then here we go. We've got our paintbrush over here and we're now going to seal the tree. And we're just going to apply it. Got to get that mixed in a little bit more. I'm trying to do this a little bit fast for the sake of the video. As you can see, some of it hasn't completely dissolved yet. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit of this just so you can see what it's going to look like when we're done. So we're going to seal that in there. As you can see, it being a watery solution, it's actually getting into the holes. It's getting into the cracks of the tree. We're going right against the living tissues, which are on each side of the wound. And we're actually um, putting it in there so we can actually tell the insects to stop damaging the tree and to give the tree an opportunity to actually heal. So here we are sealing it. And we can continue making this coat all the way around the tree. So here we are going all the way up and protecting all of the exposed wood. We can do this, again, going all the way around, even the unprotected side. Just to give this tree the best chance, it should be completely coated. Um, for the sake of this video and, and save some time, I'm gonna stop and give you a tour of the rest of the garden now. But this is something that you do to um, completely coat your tree. Now follow me, we're actually gonna head this way now. So here we are next to an Asian pear, and as you can see, loaded with apples again. And this tree also could benefit from the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard Paint as evidenced over here if you take a look. You can actually see this tree naturally has cracks that go throughout the bark. Um, this tree seems a little bit more injured because of its climate maybe over here. Sunburn and sun scald are two issues that affect trees growing up here in the Bay Area being the nighttime low temperatures and the winter are so cold that when there's a warm day the sap start flowing through the tree, but the nighttime lows still go into freezing and can cause the bark to crack. This could be evidence of some of the damage that we see here, but I want to show you how deep like this wound is over here. Um, as indicated, I'll actually show you like how deep I can actually go in with one of these, um, you know, by this piece of wood over here. You can see it actually goes in almost a quarter to a half an inch into the tree. So this is another tree that I should actually be coated and try to get some of that ivy organics in there to protect it from get, getting any wood destroying insects into the wood of the tree. It's too close to the cambium layer, um, which are the living tissues that exist right underneath the bark, which is the protective layer of the tree. 
Come and follow me. Let's see the next trees. So here we are back again. Told you we've got three fig trees over here. So this is fig tree number one. Fig tree number two. And as you can see, the figs are actually doing remarkably well. Every single leaf has a fig. Come and zoom in over here and you can take a look at this. So leaf, fig, leaf, fig, leaf, fig, leaf, fig. So you can imagine this entire tree is covered and loaded with hundreds of figs. And then we've got this tree over here. So of the fig tree varieties, this here is called the Jack and Black fig. It typically grows anywhere from 8 to 12 feet. Of all of the figs, it's one of the naturally dwarf variety of figs. And what's happened over here, as you can see, a part of the tree here has died. It was a, a multi-trunk tree with two to three branches coming off the center base. And this part of the tree didn't survive winter, as evidenced you know, by no growth over here. And this side, as you can see over here, is producing its beautiful figs. Uh, it's doing its best to do a good job, you know. But the tree, as you can tell, is not so healthy. We've got a few more figs up here, a couple more figs over here, a couple more figs over here. But let me show you what's actually, in reality, happening. Take a look at the bark. All of this is sunburn damage all the way over. If you take a look underneath the bark, it's not cracked. The damage is actually on the sun exposed area. So again, all of this should be covered. You can see the ants, here they go. Um, usually a, a, an indication that there's maybe termites inside this wood already. Um, so what you're gonna wanna do is actually seal all of this exposed and cracked wood to protect the living tissues that are underneath the bark. If this were my tree, and I'm gonna advise the owners to do, is we're gonna actually prune it back to the next living area so that this branch, um, once it produces its fruit, will be removed. We'll actually prune it um, again to the next closest living part of the tree, remove this, and as the tree hopefully continues to gain its vigor, ultimately get um, the plant to actually regrow near its base and actually create some more um, healthy branches coming from the base. Because again, there's a lot of damage that continues as you can see, all the way down to the base of the tree. So my goal would be to try to get this fig to actually grow near the root base where all of this damage will one day be removed and we can actually start fresh from, from its root source. But anyways, this here is our fig. Come and follow me, I'll show you some more trees. So this here is um, a parsimon tree. If you wanna zoom in and take a look at the beautiful fruit here. This usually ripens towards the end of the year. And as you can see, every single branch has got one to two fruit all the way around, just loaded with fruits. So this is a persimmon tree to consider growing. We come over here. We've got three cherry varieties. And these just finished fruiting just a couple of weeks ago. You can see how big they are. Um, these trees were suffering from fungus, which again, Ivy Organics 3-in-1 Tree Guard paint, the oils that are in there help also reduce against any fungus damage. I'm trying to see if there's anything still remaining that I can point out to you. But there's actually mushrooms growing out of the bark, hence the reason these branches behind were pruned. Let me show you another one over here. So you can take a look at this branch as well. So the, the bark on this particular branch actually had fungus that was growing out of it, meaning the bark was dying and it was probably dying all the way to the living tissues or what should have been living tissues underneath. Unfortunately, whoever pruned this branch didn't do a good job. They actually left this as a, um, I mean, they pretty much butchered the tree. What should have been done, and I'll just start it, is it should have been pruned somewhere closer to this point here. So I don't know if you can zoom in and see where I'm pruning it, but the goal is you want to, you want to prune the tree and remove the branch close enough to the trunk and these other branches so that it can actually heal over. By doing this, this limb will ultimately die and be a source for wood destroying organisms to get into it and then into the heart of the tree. So you're gonna to wanna to actually prune this off. I would again seal it with the IV organics to make sure no wood destroying organisms get into it and allow the tree to heal itself. A wound this large will take anywhere from five to 10 years to actually heal. It's gonna be a long, slow process and we gotta do it to give this tree um, all the years of, of success. And these trees are very heavy fruit bearing trees but whoever um, butchered these trees, um, it's, this is actually gonna harm the plant. But if we can correct this soon and hopefully get the plant off to a good start, we'll actually get a lot more fruit 
for the years to come. Let me show you what's next. So the goal here along the back hedge was to create a whole citrus curtain to basically separate this property from the neighbors behind. And what we did was select a variety of standard size citrus trees. Some of them actually grew to a standard height and some of them did not, again, depending on the variety and the rootstock. But the first thing that we have here is a navel orange tree. And this again, loaded with fruit and every year produces hundreds and hundreds of fruit. Um, and they're of all sizes and here's the smaller ones. I don't know if you can zoom in to see that But it's loaded with a variety of sizes of fruit come and follow me up these stairs and I'll show you some more fruits So here's another orange tree as well as you can see indicated by the fruits on this tree more fruits and take a look at how beautiful and healthy these trees are. Here's some more fruit as well on this tree. This here is a mandarin orange tree. Another mandarin orange tree. And then we're coming across our lemon tree. This here is a Eureka lemon variety. The Eureka, if you've been following me with my other videos, when it comes to lemons, is my favorite of the lemon varieties. As you can see, it's got um, the yellow ripe fruit if you come in a little bit lower you can actually see the smaller all the different sizes of fruit you got the um, fruit that just um, got established within the last month two months ago three months ago and it's flowering everything's happening on the eureka lemon tree this tree behind me is a apricot tree this apricot just went um, into fruit about two months ago so this one's established and back here is another lemon variety of the Meyer lemon which is which is the sweet lemon variety which is a cross between the mandarin orange and the lemon um, and apparently it has an, has its origins from China according to most scientists so the Meyer lemon tree come and follow me and I'll show you some more trees here we go another lemon tree another lemon tree another lemon tree Let's see what else we got. I know this here is going to be an orange tree. Another orange tree. Here's a mandarin orange. It's loaded with hundreds of fruit, but the fruit are smaller than, um, than a pea right now. But it's covered with hundreds and hundreds of fruit. And then again, behind me here, another lemon tree. If you haven't noticed the pattern, there's a lot of lemons. This family actually uses lemons for everything, not just lemonade, but it goes into a lot of their cooking. It goes into making fresh homemade salad dressings. It goes into a lot of um, preparation. Every single day lemons are consumed. Nothing here goes to waste. What I want to point out with this lemon tree, and I'm going to get my pruners here real quick. Is that it's got a lot of dead wood. If you notice some of these edges are turning brown. There's actually more damage around the other side, but if you take a look over here, I wanna make this really clear. So if you can zoom in as close as you can, you'll see that there's dead wood here. When it comes to pruning dead wood, there's no right or wrong time of the year. If you see it, you gotta remove it. Um, this again is a good entryway for wood destroying organisms into your tree. And the other issue with um, dead wood is that it's actually consuming energy from the tree. You wanna make sure that any dead wood is removed immediately once, once, once noticed. So we're gonna go back to where we see the next best living tissue, the next living branches. So it's gonna be this one over here. And I'm just gonna prune it right there. So this branch gets removed. You can see that there's still a few leaves on here, but it's mostly dead. And now all of the life-giving waters and sugars will go into this branch and help support some more flowers and more fruit for the years to come. You're gonna to wanna to continue this pattern throughout the rest of any of the citrus trees that you can find in your garden. Come and follow me to see some more plants. So here we are. This here is a grapevine. If you zoom in over here, you can actually see the grapes. See the grapes right in there? So this family actually consumes not just the grapes, 
but they also use the leaves for actually making grape leaf rolls. If you've ever, um, it's very common among the Greek and, and Mediterranean cultures to actually use the leaves to actually make grape leaf rolls. Come and follow me and I'll show you some more um, trees. As you can see to my right, there's another lemon tree, again of the Eureka variety, right in here. Right in here is the grapefruit tree. And you can see that even though it was purchased as a standard tree, this tree never really grew. So the chances are, this is again a 10 year old grapefruit tree, um, and it hasn't grown more than about four feet. So this was obviously either a dwarf to a semi-dwarf variety, hence it hasn't grown. So if you've picked up the wrong type of citrus tree, um, which occasionally happens, you may need to deal with an exchange with your nursery if your goal is to create the height, which was the intended use, here to basically hide um, and create a hedge against this fence so you don't have to see your next door neighbors. Um, but this here is a standard lemon tree. Again, if you take a look at the height, I'm six feet tall, so that's at least 18 to 20 feet tall. This was the intent with all of the citrus against the furthest border of this property. We wanted citrus because, again, they're year-round um, evergreen bearing trees. And it, you know there, there won't be that period in the fall where all the leaves fall off. Citrus are evergreen, year-round green. Um, and fruit bearing as well, especially lemons. This Eureka lemon is actually fruiting and flowering year round. So here's our um, grapefruit variety. Like I said, this is more likely than not a dwarf to a semi dwarf height because it never really reached more than about four feet over the last 10 years. And behind me is a lime tree. So if you take a look at the limes here, it's indicated by the fruit. And then some more fruit back here, all over. And come and follow. We'll take a look at some more. Actually, here are some more limes that actually landed on the floor. And if you take a look at the base of the tree, you'll actually see some more limes over there as well. This up here is a peach variety. We saw some peaches over there. So the bees that are on that corner of the garden are coming over here, pollinating and fruiting this tree. This is actually a first year um, peach tree. So um, it only bore about five to six fruit this year. So if you take a look over here, we've got apples. This is actually a second year apple tree loaded with apples. Probably about 10 apples here. Another 10 apples in that little zone over here. So safely about 50 to 80 apples on just this one tree, year number two. Over here, another peach tree. Looks like most of fruit was already harvested off of this. Um, this one over here is a nectarine tree. I can actually spot one last fruit in here. So you can see the nectarines. If we come back down, we'll take a look. Here's another apple. Here's the apples on the on the tree. Back here, another nectarine tree. This one here is loaded. Take a look at all the fruit on, in there. Probably another 50 to 80 fruit. No reason to go to the grocery store. Just come over here, help yourself to fresh fruit every day. Over here probably our seventh or eighth lemon tree. To my right, another grapefruit, another grapefruit tree. Over here, an orange. If you take a look, you can see the fruit in here that are near ripe. And then you can see all the babies that are ready for the next year growth. And here's some more young fruit ready for the next year. Over here, another orange tree, a lot of young fruit in here. Again, this is June. Most citrus actually ripen in the winter, so anything you're gaining throughout the rest of the year is a big plus. Peaches, another point I wanna make out, and even though we made the back wall primarily citrus, um, you'll notice that there's a diversity of plants. It's a good idea to sometimes break up your pattern, and this was the intended use over here. By having the diversity of different trees, if there's any disease or pests that actually attack one plant, you don't want it to quickly jump and attack the entire um, section of your garden. So it's a good idea to sometimes break up your garden with the diversity of different plants. Usually when we have our lemon trees, we try to stagger it with other type of citrus if the goal is to create a citrus area. Because um, there are some pests that are very specific to the type of fruit and may not jump necessarily from a lemon to an orange or an orange to a grapefruit. And to break it up occasionally with like a stone fruit such as this peach tree will help um, create a barrier 
if there's a disease that's spreading between citrus um, or also between um, the stone fruits. So it's a good idea to also create diversity within your, your Garden of Eden as, as we're viewing here. Come and follow me some more. So this here is a pomegranate tree. Again, we're in the month of June. You can see that it's loaded with flowers. And I've noticed um, some fruit just starting to take hold back here. If you want to zoom in over here, you can actually see the fruit. This here is the wonderful pomegranate variety. It's one of the most common that you'll find in the nursery. Um, it's not necessarily the softest seeds, um, but it actually has one of the best flavors when it comes um, among pomegranates. So the wonderful pomegranate, and they're typically propagated by cuttings. So it's always identical to the original wonderful pomegranate variety. If you can now follow me back this way. Here we are now next to an apple tree that's in the garden. This tree was planted about two years ago and there's so many issues with this apple tree. I had to give this one special attention. I want you to see the issues that are happening here. So this tree was planted, mistake number one, with the original stake. When, the, when it comes with the stake from the nursery, they put these bands on it to make sure that the tree's upright and doesn't get staggered among the other trees in, the, in its pot. But these bands were not intended to remain there forever. The first thing we gotta do is actually remove them. And if you zoom in actually even closer down here, you can see it's actually really constricting the life which is the, the waters and the sugars from getting up the tree. It's so tight that it's actually not growing in this area. And it's actually being constricted here, being constricted here, being constricted here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is actually remove these green bands off the tree. So we're gonna cut those off real quick. Cut. Cut and cut. And next, remove the stake. We'll remove the plastic because this is not biodegradable. We're gonna have to make sure we put that in the recycle bin. And now this tree is free. The other issue that's happening, and if it can hopefully capture this on your end, is there's actually sunburn happening to this tree. The sun, for the majority of the day, is actually um, shining against this part of the tree. And you can see the discolor discoloration between the wood on this side and then the lighter wood that's on this side of the tree. So what we need to do is actually um, protect this with a layer of the Ivory Organics Tree Guard, and it actually protects again from sunburn, sun scald, insects, and rodents. So by doing this, we're actually putting on um, a very thin layer of, let's say, lotion or a, a, a light, um, you know, a light layer of cloth to basically protect the plant from from any burn. So we're just going to coat it. And you can see I'm using actually the brown color. There's a white and a green as well. But by using the brown you can actually see that it looks very natural. Anybody that actually came into this garden probably wouldn't even know that I've actually painted and coated this plant. And you're gonna to wanna to go about as low as you can go um, to the soil level. It's a great idea you know, for any of the pruned branches, the graft line, any, any, any possible open wound, this will help seal it and give the plant the best chance to actually healing um, in a longer life. So that's done now. You can see how easy that was. It just took a few brush coats the whole trunk is now coated and now protected from sunburn, as well as in the winter, sun scald. And now we're gonna take our stake. If you've watched my other videos, I'm usually against using metal stakes, again, because this also overheats. Um, what I'm doing also protect it from overheating. I couldn't find any other stakes here um, for the demonstration purposes. So I'm actually putting a, a layer of paint on this as well which will help hopefully keep the metal a little cooler um, in the sun. Because if the trunk of the tree gets too close to the stake and the stake's overheating, it could still damage the living tissues of the, of, the, of the tree. And now we're just gonna tie it. And again, whenever you tie the tree, always first tie your knot against the stake. And again, these were just materials I was able to salvage around this um, garden area. And, and we tie it. And you can see that there's actually a gap between the stake and the tree trunk. You want to make sure that there's room now for the tree to breathe, to grow, to expand, and to allow those juices and the sugars to flow up and down the tree. So that's done now. Um, there's one other thing I want to show you now, if you can follow here me. Here we are Thanks. under a plum tree. If you can see over here the fruit, the large cluster of fruit over my head. And what I want to show you here is the issue with the irrigation problems. This fruit just fell out of my hand. But let me show you the irrigation issue that's going on down here. If you take a look, you can actually see they set up this drip irrigation system with this line and it's got these small tubes that then feed the plant and they soak it whatever their minutes or hours are per day 
But if you take a look over here, they've got these bands which are holding in place the drip irrigation. And these bands are on so tight, it's actually constricted the drip irrigation. And they're on so tight that it's actually strangling the tree as well. And I can show you the example on another tree if you follow me over here. So if you zoom in over here, you can actually see these bands are on so tight, it's actually now digging into the wood of the tree. I'm actually running my finger, it's running smooth over because these bands have actually dug its way into the bark of the tree, constricting the flow of water and sugars up and down this tree. Um, so be very careful with actually putting on bands this tight onto your tree. We've already demonstrated saking a tree and how you should keep things on loose. There's no reason that it needs to be on this tight. So keep your eyes aware for, for any issues like this. In so your here I am standing now between two more pomegranate trees. If you can zoom in, you can actually see the fruit again. And the variety on this is called again, the wonderful variety. We've got this one pomegranate tree, this pomegranate tree, and the third one, you can see there, that I showed you earlier, which is right here. So there's three pomegranate trees. All of them, the wonderful variety. If I had the choice, it would actually be at least one, if not all three, being different varieties of pomegranate. The reason, again, being cross-pollination. By actually having different varieties, it actually makes a stronger fruit. Um, just like people and having better genetics, by actually having two different people reproduce to make their children by having different genetics, it actually helps create stronger offspring. Even though we don't intend to plant the seeds, it's the seeds which are the children of the, of the tree, by actually having um, a health, healthier seed, it helps create a better quality fruit. It actually, and this is a proven fact, produces higher yields of fruit. Another example is the avocado. There's a type A and a type B avocado. So both of them avocado trees, but by planting two different varieties, both the type A or one from the type B, one of each at least, it helps increase fruit production by anywhere from five to 20%. The same principle applies to pretty much everything else. Um, so if you're gonna be planting um, and you've got room for more than one variety, again, one pomegranate tree is all you need, but by having another one, you'll actually increase quality, um, quantity, and, um, and possibly even the flavor, um, depending on, again, your research. There's one last thing I wanna show you here in the garden, follow me. So here we are next to a row of a dozen olive trees, which we've grown in a row. And again, another hedge to create a privacy for the house and also creating more food for the family to consume. We've actually alternated olive um, varieties. Every other tree is the same all the way throughout going down below. As you can see, this variety grows um, typically as a single trunk. And then this variety over here, multi-trunk. And then the next tree is a single trunk. And the next one is a multi-trunk. When they were purchased, they actually kind of had exhibited those traits. But you can always grow your olives to, um, to grow as a multi-trunk or a single trunk, regardless of the variety. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, you can actually see the fruit that are, um, that are just being produced. And again, this is the month of June. You can see how large they are. Um, and these will be fruits we'll enjoy later on this year. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed this video. We've explored over 50 fruit trees here in this um, beautiful Garden of Eden here in Walnut Creek, California. If you've enjoyed it, be sure to like it. And most importantly, subscribe down below so you don't miss all of our informative videos, which we put out on average once a month. And please enjoy all of the other videos that we put out so far um, over the last years. Again, thanks for watching and happy gardening.